Alright, I think we're just about to get started in the second half now. If you want to please take your seats. So it's, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Martin Fowler. Um, I'm sure all of you will recognize his name. Uh, for me, Martin Fowler, when I first got introduced to Martin Fowler myself, it was actually via his new methodology article that he posted, uh, I guess back in 94 or 95, I can't even remember, it was a long, long time ago. But for me, it was my first introduction to the Agile methodology, right? this new methodology that he spoke of. Um, which actually eventually led me to my journey here at ThoughtWorks as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Fowler. Thank you. Okay. So, as usual, I have as my title, Software Development in the 21st Century. If you ever see me give a talk, you'll know this is the title of every talk I give these days because it's more vague title, I can basically talk about whatever I like. <laughs> um, and that suits me. Uh, the other thing that I will do, which I pretty much always do now as a speaker, is I don't give you one long boring talk. Instead I'm going to give you three short boring talks instead. Um, and I find this helps break things up and it means that if you're not interested in one topic, hopefully you will be interested in um, the others. Although the first two topics are a bit connected. Um, in general, if you're interested in, uh, people often come up and say, can I have a copy of your slides? My slides are not designed to make any sense at all without me speaking, so I don't give out copies of the slides. However, if you go to this URL here, talk notes, I list various articles and things on my website that are relevant to the talks I'm giving, um, and you can generally find reasonable material there, as well as lots of other topics that I talk about. Now the first of my 20 minute talks is going to be on a topic I haven't talked about before. Um, it's a new talk based on talking about schemaless data structures. And this is a popular topic, topic at the moment because if you hear people talk about NoSQL databases for instance, they will talk a lot about one of their big advantages in many people's eyes is the fact that they are schemaless. This is a, a topic also that I feel is one that is very well understood. Either what we really mean when we're talking about schemalessness, and also what the real advantages and disadvantages of schemalessness are. So I'm going to talk a good bit about that. I'm going to begin really by focusing on the, um, the what side. What do we mean by not having a schema and the various ways in which it prop, crops up. I'll then talk um, a little bit about and when schemalessness is or isn't a good idea. So when we talk about schemalessness in the context of data structures, and particularly these days in, in talking about you know, SQL databases, it's generally used in comparison with um, relational databases. So of a relational database, you basically set up the structure of a relational table as you create it. You define the various columns that are allowed, and then if you want to insert data into that database, the data has to match the structure of those columns. And if you try to insert something that um, doesn't fit a field that you haven't defined, you're going to get an error. You're going to be prevented from carrying out that insertion. Now with a schemaless database, you've got a lot more flexibility. You can store a whole bunch of different records in there and there's, the database is not preventing you from whatever it is that you want to store. You gain a great deal of flexibility because of the fact that you haven't got a schema. Although, when I say you haven't got a schema, that's not really true. People talk about this stuff being schemaless, but it's not really schemaless. Imagine you've got some data stored in a, in a, in a way, and you want to find some information out. So you say, OK, I want to find out from a whole bunch of records, tell me all about certain zip codes. So you issue some kind of query, and you want to highlight the various records that match that query. But what happens if you're using your data, and you actually have a bit of variation here, such as the fact that you're naming fields differently? One of the things you can do in a schemaless database is you can store data according to any key value pairs you like. So you can store the same semantic data under different names. 
which is cool and helpful, except when you want to actually get hold of that information. And it's not going to show up where you're expecting it. The way I tend to think about this is I say, well, we may not have an explicit relational schema like we have in a relational database, but there's still an implicit schema. And that implicit schema is how the code is using the data. If you're querying based on certain field names, that's an effectively an implicit schema into that data. And the implicit schema has a big effect on how you're going to use that data. You have to understand the implicit schema just as much as you have to understand an explicit schema with a relational database. Now, so far, I've talked about this in terms of databases and said that certain kinds of databases may or may not have explicit schemas. But the same is true of any in-memory programming exercise as well. So, let's imagine we're defining classes or even older record structures in our in-memory in in processing. What we're effectively doing here is defining a schema. We're saying that if we're going to access our customer object, here are the names of the fields we're going to talk to, and if we're in a strongly typed environment, we're going to say some things about the types of things that we expect to see in there. Now, just as we can use a schemaless approach in databases, we can similarly use a schemaless approach in our in-memory um, data structures as well. A very popular approach is to use hash maps, or dictionaries, or associative arrays, whatever you like to call them, that basically have these key value pairs. And in most programming languages, we can do a, these kind of schemaless stuff. Even a statically typed, with a fairly rigid and inflexible and awkward type system like Java, we can make schemaless data structures as happily as we like. The syntax may not be as convenient as it is with cool scripting languages, but the basic operations still are the same. And just as with, um, with a database, where you've got this notion of implicit schema, that's still just as present in programming languages as well. I mean, really, the only difference between whether I'm going to use a dictionary or use a class is what's the exact syntax that I'm going to use in order to get at the information. Again, even if I don't have an explicit schema in terms of the fields that I've defined on the class, I still have the implicit schema of what keys do I actually use to insert or look up information. And if I'm putting those keys in as literal values, like this, then it's really no difference to actually having defined fields in terms of you know, how coupled I am to the data structure. You sometimes hear people say, well, the great thing about schemalessness is it means you're not so coupled to the data structure. You have more flexibility. Well, there's no real difference in flexibility when I'm typing in key names explicitly in the code. Where you may see a difference is the fact that it's now, you can actually pass in um, variable names, the variable field names, effectively, as parameters much more easily. And you can replace explicit, when you, I tend to see, feel that there's really you're not taking much advantage of the schemaless nature of a dictionary if you're just typing in literals into your code. If you're passing values around, then you're beginning to see some um, difference in it. But even there, you can typically do that with regular class structures as well, if you've got some kind of reflection um, structure. So this is how, for instance, you would do the same kind of thing in, um, in Ruby, where you can effectively call methods on some object that way. Now this notion of a difference between a schema and a schemalessness in memory is an old distinction. Um, it was brought out by Ken Beck um, back when he wrote Smalltalk Best Passes Patterns in the mid-90s. And he talked about in the Smalltalk world, again, we have this trade-off. Is it good to have what he called common state, where we have fixed um, method names, or is it good to have variable state, where we use dictionaries instead? And there are real trade-offs between the two. There are advantages which are basically the same kinds of advantages that exist for databases too. And I'll talk about those primarily later on. But before I do that, I want to bring out the point that in fact you can, don't have to choose between one or the other. It's perfectly reasonable to use both common state and variable state, to use schema and schemalessness in the same class. 
So this is an example of doing this um, in the Ruby programming language, where I can define some fixed pieces of common state, and at the same time provide a dictionary for variable state. And then I can use the common state for things where I want the more explicit schema, and use the variable state for the cases where I want the variation. It's not an either-or choice. You can combine both together. Similarly, just because you're pulling data from a schemaless store doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use it in a schemaless way in your in-memory programming language. So this is a, a common thing um, that people do, certainly a common thing I do, is that I may read data through some kind of dictionary like data structure, for instance. Maybe I've um, parsed some JSON and turned it into a dictionary, and I'm going to use that as a customer. What I'll typically want, might, might consider doing is then wrapping that round with explicitly defined methods, which are just going inside of a dictionary on the insides, but then that gives me the more explicit structure. So I may have a schemaless piece of data, but I can wrap it in a piece of schema in memory. So the point here is that, as I said, it's not an either and all choice between schema and schemaless when you're working, certainly in memory structures. You can combine the two together. And I often find that people don't necessarily think to do that very often. But it can be an important thing to do. The whole point of object orientation in many ways, or at least the, the encapsulation part of object orientation, is the fact that we can actually do uh, present one in, an interface that's different to our internal data structure. And there are lots of advantages in doing that. So we can do schemas and schemaless stuff in memory, but we can also, in fact it's very common, to see people do schemaless data structures in relational databases, which sounds kind of odd, because the whole point of relational databases is they have a schema. But it's very common to see data stored in relational da databases in a schemaless way. Here's one way in which people do this. Right? You have a whole bunch of um, fields of columns in a table with effectively named value pairs. It's bloody awful to query. Um, but people do store data this way. I'm sure if you've spent any time with relational databases, you've seen something like this. Um, here's another approach to doing it. Um, in this case, what they're doing is you're basically saying, well, let's have some kind of um, large object, typically a, in this case it's a JSON clob, um, and just stuff it into a field. Again, it's difficult to query in terms of SQL because SQL just doesn't know how to deal with this stuff very well. Um, but it's a way in which to store this kind of schemaless data into a relational database. Um, here's another scheme where typically you have some separate table that allows you to hold this extra data. And this could lead to a lot of extra joins in order to pull this off. Again, not easy to query because of the fact that um, you have to really twist SQL in all sorts of directions it wasn't meant to be twisted. But it's a common thing to need to do in a relational database. And you're not going to spend a lot of time working with relational databases without having seen at least one of those patterns. How many people have seen one of these things in their programming? Pretty much everyone. So, schemaless stuff exists in databases, it exists in memory, and it exists often in forms that aren't particularly obvious. Um, the other thing about schemas is I tend to think there are two styles of schema out there. So far, I've talked about schemas in terms of a storage control mechanism. When we think again of a relational database schema, it stops you putting the wrong kind of data into the database at all. That's its basic method. You can't put square pegs into round holes. But there's another approach um, to schemas, which I refer to as a predicate schema. And that's basically says, we'll store whatever data you like. We can have the square pegs, the round pegs, whatever you like, but we use the schema as a mechanism to say, are these pegs, pegs round or not? It becomes a way to test the data that's stored to see if it's in the, the appropriate shape. 
Now, perhaps the most familiar case of a predicate schema is where you use schemas with XML. XML allows you to store whatever you like. Right? I mean, in its very worst shape, it's any text, right? I mean, XML is usually stored as textual representations. So it may not even be well-formed XML. But even if you have well-formed XML, you can store whatever values you like in it. You can make up whatever tags, um, structure them however you like. The, however, what a schema can do is test, does an XML um, document fit a certain set of characteristics? Now, the most common um, ways of defining a predicate schema in XML are actually pretty ugly. They're over XSD, which is bleh, or DTD, which is not quite as ugly, but not as powerful. Uh, this is actually the form of, um, sch of schema language I prefer for XML. It's, this is a Relax Compact Notation, which is part of Relax NG. And um, I use it quite a lot because I think it's a very readable way to describe a schema. If you've ever written any, uh, done any grammar file definition, you'll recognize the feel for it. Hopefully, you can get a feel for how the schema here is matching um, the XML document. Now, this brings out one of the interesting characteristics of predicate schemas. Um, one of the nice things is you, there is room for more than one schema language for the same kind of thing, which is really kind of useful because scum, scum, scum I'm thinking of XML again, aren't I? Uh, some, X, some XML, well, roll back. Some schema languages are good at rep representing certain kinds of constraints, but other schema languages are better with different kinds of constraints. Why should we use only one schema language depending on what kinds of constraints we're trying to represent? Um, so one of the nice things is you have that choice. And in the XML world, you do have a good choice. But it goes even further than that, is that a particular XML document could be validated with different XML schemas. So here I'm taking another XML schema where I'm taking the one I took before and said, I want to add some extra rules to this. And this is important because this brings out a very important issue about validating any sort of information. When people think about validation, they typically say, oh, is a certain object or document or whatever valid? And they think about validity being a yes, no, general case. But I always feel that that's a bad way of looking at things. Instead, what you need to say, is a document valid for a certain context? What's a valid appointment when you're just trying to request an appointment isn't necessarily a valid appointment when you're actually confirming one. Because there's additional information you need at this later point in time. So validation is very much contextual. An object that is valid, it's valid for a certain context. And usually the best way of thinking about this, I think, is to think about that context being at something that you want to do. It's valid for carrying out a certain action. It's valid for a request. It's valid, valid for a confirmation. It may be valid for um, recording that something actually happened during the appointment. Different states, different actions that you want to do have different notions of what is validity. And this is where predicate schemas are much better because you can use multiple predicate schemas for a single thing. With, with storage schemas, Really, what the context is, is I'm allowed to store this at all. Which is often not a terribly good context. Because it's often very useful to be able to store invalid, in, invalid information because it's invalid and incomplete. And you want to be able to store that and then gradually build up more knowledge until you reach a valid point in order to do something with that information. Uh, but thinking about validity as a, as a, as a, a single yes-no global context thing gets in the way of that kind of thing. And this is where I think predicate schemas could be really very useful. So that's really a whole hunk of what schemas can be. And what I, and mainly the main point here is trying to expand. Schemas are more than what one might think of. They're predicate storage, they can be in databases, they can be in memory. Schemas come out in various different forms. So the question is, when do we want to use a schemaless approach, and when do we want to use an approach that uses a schema?
And to me, there's one really dominant thing that drives this whole thought process. Let's imagine I want to manipulate some, of some piece of information, a customer record. And, I want to, and I'm going to be schemaless, and I'm just going to treat it as a hash map, a simple dictionary. And I've got lots and lots of this stuff. It's gone out there. I'm sucking in, I've got a system that relies upon using these hash maps. And I want to get some information out of it. How do I find out what information is present in that hash map? Well, really, the only way that I can do is I've got to go into the code, and I've got to look for all the places where that hash map gets manipulated and see what the keys are. This is the problem with the implicit schema. There is going to be a schema. There's always a schema. I've got to find it. And it can be rather hard to find because there's lots of code out there. Where do I find all the different places in which this stuff is being got at? What I think it boils down to is that we don't like, or we shouldn't be liking, implicit schemas. Because there's no easy way to find out where the data is or how to put it in there. You need to, so it's really useful to be able to say, oh, I expect a first name field, and it's going to be called first name, not Christian name, because in England we call them Christian names. It's going to be called zip, not zip code, and that's where it's going to be. And a schema gives us that. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to have that schema as a storage schema. I'm not saying that we necessarily have to go that path, but it is always good to be able to say, I can find some place that expects, that tells me what my data structures are going to look like. And I have some programmatic way in which I can check to see whether things match that schema. So we can do that kind of thing with a predicate schema, we can do that kind of thing with a storage schema, but having some way of knowing what the data looks like is really, really useful. And that's my big pushback against uh, people who are saying schemaless is good. Schemaless, if it really were schemaless, yeah, it might be a good thing, but it's an implicit schema. And that is, I think, usually very bad. But that doesn't mean that we should never use it. There are cases when, the, where the, even though an implicit schema is a bad thing, other advantages are a bigger thing on top of it. And briefly, that what, what I, the typical cases I hear to boil down to these basic cases. On the left, examples of the non-uniform data. One of the most common ones, that you typically, particularly where you see these things like the various twisting of relational databases, is where people want to store custom fields. Now here we really kind of have to have a more schemaless approach, because we don't know what, scheme, what custom fields people are going to use. And the cost of the implicit schema is not so great with custom fields. Because typically when people are using custom fields, they're for very informal display on the screen, there might be access to a bit of scripting in a very localized context. So the fact that we've got an implicit schema is not such a bad problem. So, yeah, because if you need custom fields, then using some technique of implicit ske of uh, schemelessness, that can be uh, quite handy in that kind of context. Another example is when you're, the data types yourself are very non-uniform. An example of this is um, event data, for instance, where different events can carry all sorts of different data. Now, if you've got a very rich and powerful predicate schema language, you might be able to handle that quite well. But in a lot of cases, the schema language you have available is not just not up to the job. I mean, a relational database schema is very poor at handling very non-uniform data types like this. So in that situation, you go, yeah, I don't like schemaless. It's all this implicit schema stuff, but mm, I'm going to have to go with it. The other ca category of, of area where people uh, talk about schemaless being a little plus <laughs> is in schema migration, being able to cope with changes in data schemas over time. And they say, well, this is much better to do in a schemaless environment because it's easy to make changes. Here, I'm much less convinced. Because the problem is you've still got to evolve the, the implicit schema. Again, it's always there. It's just not so very easily visible. You've got a little bit more flexibility because you can say, well, since some of the records say zip and some of the records say zip codes, I can adjust my reading program so I can look for both pieces of data and perhaps pull them into a uniform interface or something. You've got a little bit of extra tools that you can use to manage it, 
But fundamentally, you still have to deal with schema migration in the same degree of care with a schemaless system as you do with a schema, uh, with an explicit schema, because again, there's always the implicit schema there. So the fundamental is, most of the time, prefer to have explicit schemas. They're worth the, the extra energy to work with because they give a clear statement of what the data looks like. There are cases where schemalessness is useful, but they're relatively, they're relatively limited cases, but they are fairly common cases. But the good news is, as I've indicated, there are ways of mixing the two together. And so combining them can often be quite effective. That's the first talk. Ooh, I get triple the amount of claps now. <laughs> so for the second talk, I'm again going to talk around the subject that cops up a lot in NoSQL um, circumstances. Um, and again, stay on relatively technical um, area. And I'm going to dive into another area that I find that people who talk about NoSQL stuff uh, in particular, often you hear the wrong messages. Here, looking at the topic of consistency. And the message that I'm going to really um, moan about a great deal is um, when people say that, well, relational databases, they use acid consistency, acid transactions, all this kind of thing. Well, NoSQL isn't like that. It does something different. Um, you sometimes, sometimes say, well, it's based because somebody came up with some clever and meaningless acronym that's even more meaningless than ACID and called it BASE. But the thing is that the story about consistency and NoSQL databases is way more interesting than just something's ACID or not. And that's what I want to at least expose you a little bit to um, in this talk. So, at the heart of this is really the fact that when we're storing data in relational databases, what we're often doing is we're taking some large clump of data, such as an order, for instance, and we're breaking it down into lots of individual rows in lots of different tables. We have to break it and splatter it about into the relational structure because the whole relational approach is based on the idea that we have these tables or strictly relations of data that we're taking around. So something that we might think of as one thing an order becomes many things in the database. Now this, of course, leads to things, you know, what could possibly go wrong if we're going to do this, right? So one thing that goes wrong, here's a, a classic example of consistency failures. Um, one person comes in, says, I want to start saving an order into the database, so I store my line items in one table, and then somebody else comes and says, oh, now I want to read a hunk of data about orders from two different tables, but I'm in the middle of my write. And he gets the state in the middle of my write. Now, this is the dirty read problem. Right? Because I have to split up my data and put it into lots of different places, somebody else can actually read the state of the database in the middle of my write and see a state of data that not just is wrong, it should have never existed. Right? Because it's completely, that was never true. And this is one of the things that acid transactions try to shield us from. But it, the important thing to remember, it's a consequence of the fact that I'm taking one thing and splitting it into lots of separate things. One of the crucial things about many kinds of NoSQL databases is that they don't have this splitting into separate things problem. They actually take the whole thing and they store the whole thing as a single thing. And this is not true of all you know, SQL databases, but it's true of many of them. And while this doesn't eliminate the kinds of consistency problems um, of dirty reads and things of that kind, it does reduce the issue because now we're storing whole things that we're thinking about. And the essence of this, uh, the way I tend to think of it, is I use this term an aggregate. We have these logical clumps of data that are aggregates that we tend to think of in a, particular, in, a, in a certain context, and we store that whole aggregate back at the database. And I use the term aggregate because it comes from Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, where he talks about one of the very valuable things about 
doing domain modeling and on modeling of the world is to, is to try and work out what the aggregates are and to think in terms of those aggregates. Now, when we look at the various NoSQL databases that exist out there, and this is not a comprehensive list by any means, but it gives you a bit of a feel for what's out there, typically they get divided up into um, categories based on their fundamental data models. And I'm not going to really explain the difference between some of these things, except really bringing one very important distinction. And that is that many NoSQL databases, in fact, most of the categories of databases, uh, NoSQL databases, are what I call aggregate-oriented, in that they store and manipulate whole aggregates of information. If it's a key-value database, it's the value. If it's a column-family database, it's the column-family. If it's a document database, it's a document. There are differences between those data models, although there's actually very blurry lines between these distinctions, but I think what's really interesting is the fact that we have this notion of an aggregate. And therefore, where the database is most useful is where there is a clear aggregates that you're manipulating, like orders um, in, a, in a purchasing system, or articles in a uh, newspaper system. Clear aggregates work really, really well with aggregate-oriented databases. But not all NoSQL databases are aggregate-oriented. The most noticeable category that isn't are graph databases which are all about lots of little bits of information connected together in complicated webs and interrelationships. Kind of like a relational database split into tiny, tiny little um, two-table relations connected all over the place. So the key thing to note here is that these graph databases, they do have ACID transactions. They have to have ACID transactions because they break up logical things into lots and lots of little pieces. The aggregate-oriented databases don't need transactions as much because of the fact that they're storing aggregates. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no need for transactions. There are still dangers of dirty rights, etc. But the, 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 it becomes a, a less prevalent effect because of the fact that you're able to operate on the large data structures all the time. So that's the first reason to think about when we're saying getting rid of this common argument. It's not true to say NoSQL databases aren't ACID, because many of them are, the graph databases are. It's also true to remember that there's a different, what we mean in terms of the atomicity part of ACID, because we've got much bigger atoms in the case of NoSQL, because they're aggregates. Let's look at a, another example of, of consistency and consistency problems. So, Here's a common situation. You've got a person talking to a browser, talking to a server, talking to a database. And of course, we're going to talk about consistency issues, so the interesting stuff is where two people are doing the same thing. So here's a common scenario. We, get, we begin by two people getting the same basic piece of information, same piece of data structure. And then, once the two of them are both reading the same thing, one of them chooses to post an update into the database, and then the other person, without realizing that post has occurred, attempts to also update the same record, but in a different way. Obviously, if we're both trying to update the same record in two different incompatible ways, we've got a problem. So we need to do something to reduce that problem. And this is where transactions save us, right? We can just take the entire interaction and wrap it into a transaction. How many of you would do this? No one's, to, no one's sticking out. But this is what transactions are for. Atomicity, isolation, consistency. No? You don't want to do it this way? No, I wouldn't do it this way either, because as we know, long-lived transactions are a bad idea. You lock up the database, etc., etc., etc. There's a bit of a bugger, really, right? Because this is the whole point of what transactions are supposed to help us to, and we can't actually use them. What we actually have to do instead is we have to wrap the transactions around the last little bit of the update, the bit that takes us from the server into the database. And this is still very useful, because it means we're not going to have problems because somebody's writing to some rows in the database or somebody's writing other rows in the database. It's not, you know, transactions aren't useless. They are helpful, but they can't solve the whole problem for us. We still have to do something on top of this, because we can still get this update clash occurring. And we probably have all done this on doing our web things. And to be the way in which we get around it is something that uh, 
uh, in my Patterns and Enterprise Application Architecture book, oh, I really should have given that a smaller title, um, I call it offline logic. And essentially what this means is, when we read the data, we read a version stamp with the data. When somebody updates that data, um, that version stamp gets updated. And that way, if somebody else pushes the same data in, and they're operating off an old version stamp, we know something's gone wrong. What we do about it depends on the circumstances, and we have to figure out what we're going to do about it, but at least we know what's going on. The same kinds of mechanisms are required when working with a NoSQL database. Because the aggregates, again, can still have this kind of thing happening, and so you typically see version stamps being used in NoSQL databases to explore the same kind of thing. But the important thing to note is that it's not necessarily any more work than what we were doing anyway. Transactions are useful and valuable, but they don't solve the whole problem for us. We still have to build additional mechanisms on top of it. And this is also why, in the definition of aggregates in uh, Eric Evans' book, he talks about how aggregates are very much defined by the fact that they're transaction boundaries. You don't want transactions to cross aggregates. And that's part of the, the, the style of working with, with that. And that's why the use of aggregate seemed to be such an obvious way of thinking about that when I came across NoSQL databases. So, so far, I've talked about one aspect of consistency, what I would call logical consistency. These kinds of consistency problems are sort of common whenever you're using some kind of multi multiple people using the same database. But NoSQL systems typically introduce a whole new area of consistency problems to do with replication. The reason why a lot of people like NoSQL databases is because of the notion that we can easily replicate the data, data in lots of different places. But of course, as soon as you start having multiple copies of the data around, you introduce a whole new way of screwing up your consistency. Again, let's look at an example. I've got two copies of the same data. The last hotel room that you want to get into for a night. And two people want to book that hotel room at the same time. So they both submit their um, requests to their local nodes. One's in, mine, Martin's node is in Boston, Promote's node is in Bangalore, uh, whatever. We both submit our things to our local nodes to book that last hotel room. Well, of course, what's going to happen in um, a nicely internet-connected world is that those two nodes will talk to each other. And as an, in the conversation, one of our bookings will be accepted, and the other one needs to sleep on a bench. So this is how it's supposed to work, right? But now let's take this uh, scenario and let's break the connection. Now what do we do? Well, we're still going to submit our requests, but we have two alternative things that can happen as a result of this. The first choice is to say, well, the connection's broken, so that's it. There's nothing we can do. We're down. We're sorry. No, nobody can book any hotel rooms. The other thing is to say, well, okay, the connection's down, so I'm going to allow two people to book the last hotel room, and I'm going to sort it out. Maybe I have a business process to handle this. You know, somebody gets very apologetic at the front desk when the second person walks <laughs> out. That's happened to me. I've come into a hotel and booked a hotel room, and I've said, oh, I'm sorry, we had a problem. Now, and I know what happened, right? They have a policy. <laughs> some hotels will say, oh, we'll always leave some hotel rooms open um, so as, as a spare buffer amount. This is not a new problem. People have dealt with inconsistency problems in hotel bookings for years. And you know, how big an issue is it? You know, usually they'll find someone, they'll make apologies, they'll give you three bottles of wine, they'll smooth it over. Is it better to do that, or is it better to shut down your entire hotel booking system while your internet connection is down? By the way, that choice isn't ours to make as the software guys. This is a business decision. Basically, what we're doing is deciding between do we want to completely consistently with the world, or do we want to make sure the system is always available and up and running? And as I said, this is not a software decision, it's a business decision. And we, the bad news is we can't do both. We have to choose one or the other. The great example of you want availability is the one that the example everyone always uses is the Amazon shopping cart. Amazon always makes sure you can put stuff in the shopping cart. Because what is the most important thing to be able to do in America? Shopping. 
nothing must stop the shopping. <laughs> so, what we see is something that's been called the cat theorem. Um, where we're talking about consistency available and this thing called partition tolerance, which is a fancy word meaning the network got broke. <laughs> and basically when people talk about the cat theorem, they say, there are these three things that you would like to have. The ability to, 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 to run when the network's broken, be consistent, be available, and by the way, you only get to have two or three of these things. That's how you've often heard it. I think this is not a particularly good way to think about the problem. The way I think about the problem is to say, if you're in a world where you may get a network partition, right, which is not going to happen on a, on a single server machine where everything's together, right? it's either up or down, it doesn't kind of split in two. As soon as you want to put data across a, a, a length of cable or a wireless or whatever, you may have a network partition. If a network partition may occur, then you're going to have to choose between consistency and availability. You have to choose. You don't get to have both. Now, having said that, it's not a binary choice. There are degrees of consistency and availability you can work with. There are also different transactions can have different properties. Some situations you may want to really be consistent. Some situations you're going to go for the availability instead. So you have lots of choices. And they are choices based on business needs. Again, it's not a technical thing, it's a business choice. What matters most? Everybody likes to use banking examples as to say why well, you should always be consistent. Banks are very good at dealing with inconsistency, as you'll find out all the time if you've ever worked anywhere near a financial system. And it's actually not usually a choice between consistency and availability, interestingly enough. It's often a choice between consistency and response time. It's latency that matters here. If you're going to have to talk to external systems to make sure you're consistent, what does that mean? It means that every time you have a transaction, you've got to be making remote calls to remote systems. What do we know about remote calls to remote systems? They're slow. So often you'll find them actually trading off consistency and response time. I mean, you know, somebody's wanting to buy this really important thing. Are you going to hang around waiting to make sure all the shopping carts are consistent before you accept the, the plopping of something in the shopping cart? Of course not. What is the most important thing for Americans to do? Shopping! Thank you. And in fact, if you've done any concurrency work ever in your life, you'll probably know this is really just a special case of the, the fundamental trade-off in concurrent programming, which is between safety and liveness. So that's a very brief tour of consistency in some of the consistency issues in NoSQL databases. These are a bunch of topics I'm not talking about because I haven't got time in my little 20 minute burst. But what I do want to really leave you with is the notion that this, notion, this idea that relational databases are acid and good and consistent and NoSQL databases are either badly inconsistent or wonderfully flexible it's really not a very useful distinction. I think it's much more useful to remember that um, when we're looking at the NoSQL world, we have to think about the differences between the aggregate-oriented and the non-aggregate-oriented databases. And the aggregate-oriented, because of the no notion of putting things together in aggregates, allows us to think about consistency. Uh, and transactions become less important because of that. And also because of that, as we bring in replication and distribution, we end up with this trade-off of consistency and liveness. And of course, the most important thing for any American is shopping. shopping. Right, you've got to be better at that. The Danes are really good by number three. They were able to say, shopping! That's, that's what Americans like. Of course, they've got plenty of shops in Denmark as well, so they can hardly talk. Anyway, for more on this, in a uh, mandatory uh, book advert, um, I could spend a lot of time talking about all my various books, but I'm only going to show you one book after that. And that's that book that was I did with my colleague Promote Stadalgy, um, which is why all the examples have me and Promote. Um, here's the intelligent one of the pair. Which, uh, no, I don't want to go there. Okay, so that's the second talk. And you don't need to clap after the second talk. I'm not. <laughs>
the final talk. A bit more waffly and higher level in many ways. There will be no code shown in this talk. At least I don't think so. But actually a very fundamental talk, both to people who write software and to people who manage or buy software. Really comes down to a very existential question for me. Because my whole career is based, and my whole life's work is based on trying to understand what is good software design. Which raises the question of, well, why should anybody care about software design? What is its value? And it's triggered by things like this. How many people have heard this from a, a manager or customer? Yeah, it's very familiar, isn't it? Or, or when people come to me and they say, oh, it's terrible, we've got to meet these deadlines. People say, we can't afford to make good quality code because we have to go fast. So how do we react to this? How does people react to this? Yeah, well, one example, anybody recognize this guy? Lots of people recognize this guy, Bob Martin, Uncle Bob, um, paragon of software craftsmanship. His approach to this issue of what is the value of software design basically runs like this. His argument sort of, I would lay out as this way. Bad software design is a sin! <laughs> if you hear people saying that you should push inappropriate responsibilities together, that is Satan speaking! <laughs> and if you should ever choose to name a variable badly, it will be branded on your flesh as you burn in a fire's hell. <laughs> so basically, this argument is a moral argument. Right? It's saying that you're a bad person if you are doing good design of your software badly. But this is not a very, actually a very satisfying argument to me, mainly because I can't do the preacher thing that Bob likes to do. I can't take it seriously enough to do for more than about ten, five minutes. But also because I'm deeply cynical. You know, it's all very well to say that it's a right and moral and proper thing to do good software design, but I'm cynical enough to believe that, you know, the right and proper thing is always trumped by money. So, to me, if software design is worth doing, there's got to be an economic reason, not a moral reason. Otherwise, why bother? So what is the economics here? So let's go back to this phrase that I threw up at the beginning. What's going on here is the notion, the heart, and here is a mindset that says that quality is something that's tradable. But if I want higher quality, I have to pay more for it. And this is a very natural notion, right? Because it's true of many things in our life. Now, we want the really nice Ferrari Testarossa, but we choose instead to have some Toyota Camry because we can't afford the Ferrari. Now, we want nice clothes, nice food. We're constantly making trade-offs. Do I get the really nice artisanal cheese or not? And a lot of the time, the trade-offs are based on this notion of quality versus cost. If I want high quality, I have to pay more. But what do we mean when we talk about quality in terms of software? Well, we mean lots of different things. Now, is, is the user interface nice? Is the code nicely structured? All of these things are different things that we can talk about as quality. But there's a very important distinction that comes across these things. And that is that some of these things are not visible to the people who buy the software. Let's imagine that Ken over here is selling this wonderful piece of software that does flubbing, whatever flubbing is, and he'll sell it to you for $100. My good friend at the back there, Ryan Murray, wonderful guy, um, who I'm, I've now, he can't even tell I'm talking about him, he's not listening to me at all. But Ryan here has also some software that does flubbing, and it costs $500. They both do exactly the same thing. Now, as it turns out, in, you look inside Ken's software, it's appalling, it's really dreadful. He's made a horrible mess of things. Ryan's software is beautifully crafted. Uncle Bob would approve. Thank you, Mark. But if I'm the buyer, what do I care? This is 100 bucks, this is 500 bucks. Why should I care? Right? 
It's not visible to them. The way I look at this is it's a distinction between external and internal quality. What matters to me as a buyer is the external quality. So why does internal quality care at all? Why should anyone care that the horrible state inside um, Ken software? I answer this question with, by plotting a little pseudo graph. Typically, when we look at a lot of software projects, we say, well, we can move really fast at the beginning. We can really add new features very rapidly, but as time goes on, things slow down. If we don't pay attention to good design, the speed at which you can add new features drops. And so after a while, you feel like every time you want to do something to the code, you've got to spend ages hacking your way through the code base to actually do even the simplest things. How many people have worked on a project like that? Most of us. But with good design, there's an alternative that says, as we carry on working through the project, we are building up this nice little bit library of reusable components that we can arrange and tweak in new ways. We can add new functionality functionality really, really quick because we're just combining things together, doing a quick over here, and we can do really powerful things very quickly. We don't have this effect of slowing down, we kind of almost have an effect of speeding up. <coughs> How many people have worked on a project like that? Less people, but still plenty of people. That's the difference between good internal quality and poor internal quality. It means that when in two years' time, comes along, Ryan has produced a dozen really significant updates that have made his software really compelling and powerful. Ken has barely managed to struggle one out because of his crappy code base. <laughs> Over time, what that design quality matters, but it matters in an economic way. For me as a buyer, I'm buying that ability to add new things really rapidly and really quickly. So that's the heart of the argument. I refer to this as the design stamina hypothesis, which is, I realize, a somewhat a long-winded name. But the point is, design is what gives us the stamina to be able to go quickly for long periods. And I call it a hypothesis because I can't prove that these curves exist. But I intuitively have experienced them and believe them to be true. And most software developers I know also have seen this difference. Now another way of thinking of the design standard hypothesis is saying, well, I want to add a new feature. If I've got a clean code, it's much less than my typical not so well done code. Essentially, when I want to add a new feature, there's a cost of due to that poor design. That means that every time I add a new feature, it's costing more than it ought to be. And you feel this every time you say, it really ought to be easy to add this new feature, but I've got to do this, 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 and this, this, this before I can add it. That's that difference coming in. So, a guy came up with a really good way of thinking about this problem, or at least talking about it. How many people recognize this guy? Ward Cunningham, the inventor of wikis, and therefore the uh, grandfather of uh, Wikipedia, um, and also a very major figure in design thinking in the small talk world, very big influence on the early days of extreme programming and the whole Agile revolution. He came up with a metaphor to think about this. He said, well, what we've got is a difference in complexity in our code base is causing extra effort for new features. We can think of this as like a debt. By taking on this extra complexity, we're taking on a debt. And when you've taken on a debt, there's two things you could do. You can either keep on paying the interest, which is the additional cost for every feature that comes through, or you can pay down the principal, which means cleaning up the code. That's the trade off you face. Do you want to keep paying the interest, or do you want to pay off the principal? And that also begins to give us a way of thinking about how do we deal with substandard stuff in our code base. I mean, this module over here might be a load of crap. Badly written, if Ken was at it, you know, woo. But, you know, I never need to touch it. I never need to enhance it. It actually doesn't have very many bugs in it for some weird reason. So the fact that it's a mess doesn't matter because it's not exerting very many interest payments on it. On the other hand, I may have some code over here that is not as messy, but I'm always in it, I'm always touching it. So as a result, it's more important to keep it clean, pay down that principle, because otherwise the interest payments will keep hammering me. 
And that, I think, is a good way to think about dealing with the mess that builds up in code bases. Is it worth paying down the principal, or is it worth paying, pay, paying the interest all the time? And like the choice between consistency and availability I talked about earlier on, there's no way you can avoid this choice. You have to pay one way or the other. The question is, which is the most efficient to work with? And this, I think, is what makes the technical debt metaphor so useful. It's a good way to communicate to non-software developers the consequences of crummy design. Because it's great to get to say, this is the choice we have. Do we keep going slowly, or do we put some effort into cleaning up and slow down? And that put some effort into cleaning up isn't necessarily meaning stop the world for two months while you clean up. I don't actually think that's always, almost ever a good thing. It's a case of, I'm going to put the energy into cleaning up little bits as I go. To put that effort into bending that, that curve the other way, so that I can continue to go more quickly. And of course, we start from the beginning by doing that. We try to always work to keep code clean. And the benefit we get from that is we're able to go quickly more often. We cut down the amount of technical debt in the system. We don't take it on so much. So the technical debt metaphor is, I think, a very valuable way to communicate and think about how we deal with suboptimal code. But it does, of course, raise an interesting question, which is, how does technical debt appear in the first place? Why does code get messy? So one example is, um, can be actually quite a reasonable example. And it's where you've got some very important demand deadline that you've got to hit. And you can say to yourself, well, I can see two ways to tackle this. One is a really clean way. It's going to keep a good, healthy code base. One is a bit more messy, but I can get there before the deadline. So in some cases, it can make sense to say, I will take the messy route. I will incur the debt. I know I'm going to have to either keep paying interest on it or go through a period of paying off the principal later on, but I've thought about it and it's worth it because it's really important we get this new feature in this product before uh, an important trade show or the end of the year or whatever the timing might be it is. But that's not the form of technical debt most, most of us tend to see most of the time, at least not most of my colleagues tend to see most of the time, or at least what most of my colleagues tell me about. The debt I tend to hear about is, oh, we've gone into some um, code base that we've not seen before, and oh my god, these people had no idea what they were doing. This code is horrible. It's a real mess. <coughs> now, some people have argued, in fact, I had a little argument with Uncle Bob about this. He said that he didn't feel that, that was technical debt. It didn't really count as technical debt. And my response to that was, well, I still think the metaphor is valuable. Even if you've got a horrible mess of code written by people who didn't know what they're doing, you've still got that trade off, right? Do I pay, keep paying the interest, or do I pay off the principal? What proportion do I go? I've still got that choice. So I think the metaphor is still valuable because the choice is there. There are differences how it was caused. And perhaps the most important thing about that difference is that one of those debts was taken on prudently. Someone thought about it, thought about the trade offs and took on the debt, and the other one, the person was an idiot. I mean, and that fits the debt metaphor, right? It, do we all know people who take on huge amounts of debt recklessly? We can think of governments that do this, right? I mean, it's not hard. So, just as in financial world you've got reckless and prudent debt, in technical world you've also got reckless and prudent debt. But there's also another distinction that's very interesting here. And that is, in the first example, the person taking on the debt knew what they were doing. But a lot of big messes, people don't know. They didn't even know they were taking on the debt. They just didn't even know how to do good design. So as a result, they took on debt without realizing it. So we've got two distinctions here. Reckless and prudent, deliberate or inadvertent. And what's the most important thing I've just done? Put up a quadrant. I've created a quadrant! Yeah, see, I can do it too! Hey! <laughs> see, we're the big ass consultants, we can do quadrants. <laughs> so, of course, the interesting thing about the quadrant is what goes in the empty holes? Right? So, let's take this the easy one first reckless delivery of debt. Now, I say it's an easy one to fill, but it's a difficult one to spot in practice. 
Because we're constantly exhorted to make this trade-off. This is the trade-off that people say. Oh, they're telling us we don't have the time to write good quality code. We've got to go fast. Therefore, we're sacrificing speed. Well, that can be a prudent thing, but it's more often a reckless thing. Because people haven't got the trade-offs quite right in their mind. And to do this, to help illustrate this, let's go back to that little curve I showed you earlier on. Now, the trick, of course, is you're trading off, the whole point of this prudent net is you're trading off, you're saying, the value that I get by shipping two weeks earlier is going to be more than the cost that I'm going to incur due to interest or paying off principle afterwards. Right? That's the prudent way of thinking about this back and forth. And a lot of people screw that up because they underestimate the cost. And they perhaps overestimate the value. Well, yeah, whatever. But the really interesting thing is notice that that, that trade-off only occurs until those lines cross. Right? I refer to this as the design payoff line. If you're below that line, then you've got this trade-off. But once you're above that line, there is no trade-off. Making the quality lower will actually slow you down. And this is the heart of the problem. When people say, think about this in moral terms, and say, we must do good design because that's in order for us to be good craftsmen, etc., etc., and those evil managers are pushing us back. As soon as you're thinking about the problem in those lines, you've lost. Programmers have lost, the customers have lost, the managers have lost, everybody's lost. Because they're, they're, they're sacrificing quality in order to go slower. That doesn't seem a worthwhile trade-off. <laughs> if you're above the design payoff line, that's what happens. And that's, of course, what happens to most teams. They make an economically stupid decision. If you frame it in terms of morality, you've lost. Because you're fighting morality versus economics. Economics tends to win. You've got to wrap, you've grab hold of the economic aspects of this. Now, unfortunately, what makes it much harder is we have no way to measure this, right? Now, in the financial world with debt, they have this easy-to-measure thing called money, and they still screw it up. <laughs> now, what hope have we when we're talking about things that aren't to do with money? So, unfortunately, I can't tell you where that design payoff line is. We don't know. But from my experience and from the people I've talked to, I would say it's weeks, not months. It way, comes way faster than we think. It's amazing how quickly. One long bug hunt, and you can blow any benefit you get from speeding things up. And it's very easy, as you know, to be caught by a bug hunt and blow away a day, two days, and suddenly that extra four hours of work to have done things right has, been, has completely been dissipated. It also raises another point as well, that when I wrote the refactoring book, one of the things that people said is, how do you persuade managers to give you the time to refactor? Um, you know, my, my answer, I, I don't know. Um, but my answer then was, well, actually, you don't tell them. And that wasn't as strange as it sounds. Because my view was, it is the people who are working in the code base who can un who've got the best feel for what's going on in this curve. Right? We are the best people to assess what the costs and trade-offs are about design payoff line. If we choose to go faster by cutting down on quality and ending up by causing more cost in the, in the medium term, effectively, we're giving bad advice to the people who are counting on us to do a good job. We're robbing our customers. That's our fault. That's not a good thing. That's where the morality does come into play. Right? It's not good for us to be robbing the people who are paying us. But having said that, you have to think it, I think, overall in, in an economic term. I think thinking of it in terms of, uh, of this, the benefit of design is the way to do that. Anyway, I have a quadrant to fill. Prudent inadvertent debt. Now that sounds really weird, doesn't it? I mean, if you think in financial terms, and I've heard some people suggest things, I can't think of any good analogy in financial terms. Prudent, wise debt that you take on without realizing you're doing it. And yet it happens all the time in software development. This is where the analogy kind of doesn't work so well. When does it happen? 
But it was crystallised to me really well when I was chatting with one of my colleagues in London. I, I try to go around the various offices of ThoughtWorks and talk to people who do real work, because, you know, for me to write and give talks like this, I have to pretend I know what I'm talking about. The only way I can find out is by people, talking to people who really do stuff and they can tell me what's going on. So I was doing that in London with one of our lead um, developers, and he was talking about this project he'd been on for the last year or so. And the project had gone really well. The customer was really happy, they built some good code, delivered it, shipped it, smiles all around, everyone was happy. But I could tell hey, he wasn't really completely happy with it. And I kind of probed a little bit, so Ben, so what was up? They said, well, you know, the design was pretty crummy, really. And I sort of sat back, but Ben, you're one of our best developers, you're one of our best architects. What do you mean? I can't believe you would have let the design go crappy. And he said, no, it wasn't that. I didn't deliberately let it go crappy. It's just that I now know how we should have built the system. I didn't know when we started, and I made mistakes because of that. But now I know, a year later. How many people have had that sensation? <laughs> Everyone, right? Because we learn as we go. So, and this is actually the technical debt Ward had in mind when he first talked about it. We take on this debt because of our lack of knowledge, our lack of understanding of the problem, often our lack of understanding of technologies because of the rapid change that we see technologically. Usually, about a year into a project, you say, oh, now I know how I should have started this. And that's kind of inevitable. And that's a common and consistent, and the very best teams in the world will create debt that way. We, I don't know any way to avoid it, other than building the same identical system in the same identical technology two or three times. Except I can do that much easier with CP minus R, so I don't really see the point. But basically, we always take on a certain amount of debt. And that also, of course, is something to bear in mind when it comes to the other forms of debt. Because we've already got a certain amount of debt we're taking on whatever we do, we've got to be extra careful about adding more. So, um, there's a bunch of stuff I've written on the web in the past about that, on my blog and things. Um, they're all summarised in that talk talk notes link. That is the last talk, and I hope you found it useful, um, even if great. Alright, thank you. I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions, I believe. Yes, we have a few minutes. Um, anyone has any questions? Hi. This uh, question is prompted by uh, one item in the second talk and two in the third, so I figured I'd ask Kevin. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming the answer is yes, but. <laughs> Are you familiar with Rich Hickey's work uh, in the closure ecosystem on Datomic, and if so, do you have opinions? Um, I have listened to a talk, read a little white paper, I haven't played with Datomic. Um, I'm actually really interested in it because um, one of the things that, that I've, a number of my little talks that I didn't talk about, is the notion of event sourcing which is by saying that when we're, stuck, when we're working with a system, we, it's a useful idea to record every single thing that updates the state of the system and keep that log of changes forever so that we can at any time determine the historical state of the system or look at how it got into an interesting state. Mental is a very powerful thing. Um, the way I tend to typically talk about it is say it's really treating our base data store the way we treat Git or any version of control system. Right? Git works because it knows every change that was ever done and is able to synthesize the state of the system. And that gives us some incredible capabilities. And we don't give that ability to our customers typically, but when you do it, it can be incredibly powerful. And so the atomic very much moves in that kind of way. Right? It stores all of these little datums, is what they call the events. Right? And then, of course, it's built on the idea of you've got a, in, 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 lock, you want to work immutably all the time. So you function program. So there's a lot of very interesting things about it. But I haven't played with it, and also I don't know that any of our ThoughtWorks projects have actually tried anything out with it yet. And I, my attitude tends to be, I may think something is really cool, but I don't actually believe it's cool until I've seen at least one, preferably three ThoughtWorks te separate ThoughtWorks teams use it. 
When I've heard three thought works people tell me this good stuff is good, then I can believe it. So when we, for instance, got into Ruby in the early days, I was using Ruby before anyone else in ThoughtWorks, as far as I know, for my own personal work. But you know, what I do, running my website, isn't what we do on our projects. It was only when I heard a project over here, project over there, project over there, all felt that Ruby had given them some useful advantages, would I stand up and say, I think Ruby is actually good stuff. Now I don't need to do that so much. That's how the tech radar works, the full works technology radar. It's basically you know, 20 of us all sniffing around and saying, come on, we've got to see proof. So Datomic at the moment is in the, oh, that's really interesting. I think that could be really cool. But until we've actually put it into use with a customer, got it into production, then we'll know whether it is actually cool. But I can't remember where it is on the radar. Someone might have one to be able to tell me, but I bet it's in the early, you know, we're really interested in this sector. Because I think it is a very interesting technology. Thank you. Over oh, there. Uh, so my question might be actually, uh, the previous one could be a good segue. Uh, so what happens when uh, a code that you have written over the years that has been, you know, not so bad, you don't necessarily consider it a big principle, uh, becomes uh, sort of obsolete because new technology emerges and it's proven by the industry that it's, it's better, it's faster to develop, say, uh, or people consider Ruby to be a more faster uh, way of implementing certain things. Uh, that sort of makes your old code base obsolete and you could have done things faster and better if you would have adopted this new technology, but then you have to go to your management and tell them about all these uh, you know, great things that you would have done only if you could have started. Well, you can use the technical debt analogy again, right? The print, paying off the principle would be re-implementing the system in a new, more productive language, which is a big principle, but you know, that's what it is. The interest payments are the extra cost of working in your existing technology versus what it would be if you were working in the new technology. So again, it's, a, it's an economic trade-off. Now, having said that, how do you compute it? It's obviously much harder, right? And the, the, the differences are quite it's difficult. The legacy. Yeah, but I mean, that's, I mean, that's funda that, that fundamental trade-off. Is it worth continuing the credit price and moving slower than you could move? Or paying the bigger price to shift things over becomes part of that. And that's, of course, one of the things that's driving a lot of my colleagues in um, increasingly what we're pushing our clients to do is to say, try and build systems in terms of more independent, smaller pieces. Not, and that's part of that's the mod modularity argument that's been going on forever. You know, always try to break down components into smaller components. Um, although, of course, then the risk is how well do they communicate together, you can end up just moving the complexity from within the component into the component interconnection, so it can often be hard to spot. But one very interesting benefit is, if you make these components small enough, you lower the price of completely ripping them out and replacing them. And that, of course, is very interesting in the context of technological changes, to say, okay, let's make it so that rewrites become more economically feasible. Now, will that work out in the longer term? I'm saying it's, my feeling is it's too early to tell. Um, but it's certainly a direction I see more and more people going. And that's partly because of exactly that argument. It's just so hard to predict what languages to go with. Particularly now that we're in a much more um, fluid and divergent state. I mean, back in the 90s, the world was converging on Java. And then for a while it seemed like the choice was Java or .NET. That was really the only decision you had to make. How, how do you like Microsoft or not? That was basically the decision. It was never a technical decision, right, between Java and .NET. It was purely how did you feel about the, the, the beast from Redmond. Um, now, though, there's a huge amount of variety out there. And that's making the decision a lot more complicated to work with. All right, sorry, I think we're, uh, we're just about out of time. But the good news is that we're going to be here afterwards. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to come and talk to us. We'll be more than happy to. Angela. So uh, I think that's it for the evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we do have some logistical <clears throat> questions. We're going to be sending out an email that will have some uh, video clips from tonight's event to uh, the mailing list. So uh, be expecting that sometime next week. Uh, we do have some feedback cards and we tried to make it pretty simple. Uh, green, good, yellow, okay. Red, bad, so if you don't mind filling that out, that is very helpful to us to help us refine uh, the content that we provide. Uh, we'll continue to do events like this in the Bay Area, uh, so keep looking for uh, things that we keep putting forward. And 
Most of all, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Martin, for uh, taking the time out to uh, speak to all of us and uh, appreciate uh, everyone uh, attending tonight's event. So thank you very much.